Abby didn't know what to do. Since her best friend was now an orphan, she convinced her parents to let Wendy stay with them until they graduated from high school. After that, she was going to move in with her aunt over the summer. Abby's main reasoning was that Wendy was going to need someone to lean on after such a horrible tragedy. Abby believed that she could be that person, but ever since Wendy moved in, she'd started becoming withdrawn from the world around her. Wendy hardly talked to anyone. She barely ate, and she often woke up screaming in the middle of the night. She always acted as if someone was following her, watching her, yet she always wanted to be alone. Not to mention her appearance had become startling from lack of sleep and care. When Abby tried talking to her, Wendy just shut her out. Abby didn't want Wendy to deal with her pain alone, but what could she do? It wasn't like before, when the worst thing that could happen was a petty argument with her parents. Her parents, if only they were here, but if they were here, then Abby would be having this problem. It was all his fault, how she hated him. From the moment she laid eyes on him, she knew he was trouble. But Wendy couldn't see it. All she could see was someone she could try to save. Now it was her who needs saving. And he was out there, somewhere. A month after the murders on a rainy evening, Abby lay in her bed. Across the room from her, Wendy lay in her own bed, scribbling furiously in a diary she had been keeping. When she finished, she placed it on the side of her bookshelf with her other belongings. Wendy then peeked out of her window and froze for a moment before closing the curtain. She looked over at Abby, who was starting to fall asleep. Abby? Hmm. Remember when we first met in middle school? Yeah, why? I was just thinking back on my life and how far I've come. I've been trying to write them all down, all the good memories I have to leave behind after I'm gone. Abby sleepily propped herself up on one elbow to look at her. Gone. Where are you going? Winnie didn't respond right away. Nowhere. It was just a figure of speech. Abby stared at her for a moment before collapsing back onto her pillow. Don't scare me like that. They were both silent for a moment. Abby started to drift off to sleep again. When we met, I was a weird kid, Wendy said, waking Abby up again. I remember how nobody talked to me at first. I spent most of my elementary school alone because I wasn't in the same things as every other kid my age was. Then one day, you spoke to me. Yeah, Abby slurred, trying to remember. Told you I liked your dress, the one with the blue flowers on it. Yep, and we've been best friends ever since. And after that, more friends came. Mm Mm-hmm. I never thanked you for that, for being my friend. You don't have to thank me. I liked you. I liked the fact that you were different. At least back then you were. High school normalized you. They both chuckled. Yeah, I became normal. Whatever that means. But I still drawn to weird people. Yeah, Abby yawned. Remember all those guys I dated? Wendy laughed. Stefan, Drew, Gary, the guy who was obsessed with chins, Jeff, the homicidal psychopath. Wendy was quiet for a moment. Abby sat up and looked at her. I'm sorry, but I can't help being a little mad at you for this. It's been a long enough time since the funerals for me to say that. I know you couldn't have known, but the worst part is that you've changed on me. This is the longest conversation we've ever had since. No, you're right. I haven't met a good friend. I'm sorry. Abby lay back down. No, don't be sorry. I forgot about the golden heart of yours. I could never think ill of anyone, not even him. He didn't seem dangerous at all while we were dating. Wendy said in a quiet voice. He was a bit distant and quiet, but I thought he genuinely loved. Wendy looked up to see Abby had drifted off to sleep. She got up and walked over to her friend's bed, crouching down in front of her. She tucked some stray hairs behind her ear, leaning down. She whispered, Thanks for being my friend. Abby opened her heavy eyes long enough to see Wendy quietly walk out the room. Wendy, where are you going? She moaned. But sleep overtook her as her vision got blurry, and then everything went black. The next morning, Abby woke up to find Wendy's bed empty. In fact, it didn't seem like it was slept in. Abby sat up and tried to remember what happened the previous night. All that talk about looking back on her life and thanking her for being her friend. It almost seemed like she was saying goodbye. Abby searched the house, calling her friend's name, but she was nowhere to be found. First, she alerted her parents, and the police, and then the whole town. Some people claimed to have seen her at night when she went missing, but no matter how many search parties they sent out, no matter how much the reward was for any information on her whereabouts, 
No matter how much Abby wished, Wendy remained missing. Two months after her disappearance, Abby noticed that the police were starting to give up. They had no leads. They had no evidence of any kind. They began treating her as a runaway because of the deep depression over the death of her parents. Never mind the fact that none of her clothes or belongings were missing. They didn't even bother to look through them. They assured Abby and her parents that Wendy would return when she was ready, or that she would eventually be found. Abby wasn't convinced, but she couldn't convince anyone else to listen to her. Her mother and father cared about Wendy very much, but they had tried and wanted to get on with their lives. So Abby had to find her friend on her own, or at least find out what happened to her. Abby decided to start with, with Wendy's computer. Her boyfriend, Tucker, was an expert hacker. He could hack just about anything. So when Abby asked if he could try and break into her computer, he was almost insulted that she even asked if he could do it. After they successfully hacked into her computer, they did a wide search, finding nothing suspicious. They decided to check her emails. But even after hacking into it, there were no emails or messages of any sorts giving them a clue. <sighs> Abby sat back in her chair, ex exasperated. This is hopeless. Don't give up yet, babe, Tucker said, getting up and massaging her neck. I'm sure there's no need for any of this anyway. She'll come back. Yeah, and when she does, I'm going to beat the living crap out of her. Shh. He whispered. He massaged her neck a little bit harder, causing her to moan softly. Tucker smiled. Hey, I still have half an hour before I have to meet up with the guys. Your parents are out. Want to fool around a little? Abby leaned her head back to grin at him. I could use some comfort. After he left, Abby straightened herself up and then continued to explore Wendy's computer. Looking at her search history, Abby wondered what was going through her friend's mind before she disappeared. There were searches about night terrors, sleep paralysis, and articles on other recent disappearances happening around town. Abby eventually found herself back in Wendy's email. She hadn't thought before to check the spam folder, so she clicked on it. Abby was shocked to find there were hundreds of messages in the folder, all from an anonymous email address. Abby clicked on the email, which read, I'm coming for you. Abby was more than a little spooked. She clicked on another one. Gonna get you, baby. Abby was frightened. But she clicked on another one, another one, and another one. The more she read, the colder the chill creeping up her spine became. Don't try to run. No one can save you from me. There's no escape. There's nowhere to hide. You'll be mine again. You better not tell anyone. They're next. The messages dated all the way back to the day after her parents' funeral. Abby shook her head as hot tears ran down her cheeks. So she had been dealing with this all by herself for so long. No wonder she had changed so much. She wouldn't let anyone in. Abby composed herself and clicked on the very first message sent to Wendy. I want you, but we won't be separated for much longer. Jeff is coming. Abby's hands flew to her mouth. Jeff, of course. There was no denying it now. Jeff had something to do with this. But first, she needed more proof. Abby quickly wiped away her tears and began to look through all Wendy's things. She looked through her book bag her side of the closet, under the bed, and the side of her bookshelf. She flipped through some of her notes, and what she found were messages sloppily scrawled by her in the migraines of almost every page. Jeff is coming. Jeff is coming for me. There's no escape for me. It's all over. I can't run. I can't hide. He won't stop. I have to protect them. No one else needs to die. Jeff. 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 He's coming. She tossed it onto Wendy's bed to get to the police and looked through her other notebooks and textbooks all the same. How could she have kept it all inside all this time? Abby glanced at the titles un under her eyes, rested on Wendy's journal, particularly hitting underneath a world history textbook. Cautiously, she picked it up and read the first entry. Dear Abby, if you're reading this, stop right now. But now I have probably disappeared, and I know you want answers, but it's too dangerous. Just forget about me. Move on with your life. You're strong, stronger than I am. But there is an evil in this world that even you can't fight. You'll definitely lose. She'll just put this down. In fact, bury it or burn it. It doesn't matter now that I'm gone. I only kept it so I could stay sane. I wanted to write down everything I, I could remember about my life so that I wouldn't forget. I wanted to talk to you so badly. But, I, but that would have sealed your doom. I won't make the same mistake twice. Goodbye. Abby, you're my very best friend. I love you. Have a great life. Love, Wendy. 
After a few moments of uncontrollable sobbing, Abby wondered why she left the journal behind if it was so dangerous. Maybe she didn't get the opportunity to get rid of it. Abby stared at the journal, conflicted about whether or not to continue reading. She decided to take the chance. She flipped to the next page, but it was just an entry about her earliest memory. It went on like it was the first half of the journal, as if she were trying to write down every single memory of her life that she could remember. Even the memory of when they first met was on there. Abby smiled as she tried to blink back tears, but then it took a dark turn. Wendy began to write about nightmares that she'd been having, one about a pear-faced figure chasing her through the cornfield. Abby had heard about that night when Wendy was telling the police about her parents' murder. She remembered fearing infuriated about the fact that the police couldn't find the killer, even though she, he was just a teenage boy. The entries continued. Apparently, Wendy sometimes couldn't sleep at night because she'd hear noises outside the window. Sometimes when she thought she was alone, she could feel that someone was watching her. But when she looked, no one was there. There's someone there. It was confirmed by the messages she was receiving. There was even a time when she actually saw him. It was a cold night, but a week before she disappeared. She had gotten up close to the window when she saw him. He was standing outside their window with his hood up, head held down. Since their bedroom was on the second floor, he couldn't reach her. Still, he slowly lifted his head and locked his eyes with hers. Wendy gasped at the sight of his face, but she didn't turn away. They stayed like that for what seemed like hours, but when Abby shifted in her bed, blissfully unaware of any danger, Wendy turned to make sure that she was still asleep. When she turned back to the window, he was gone. If she knew it was him, then why did she gasp when she saw his face? Abby wondered aloud. She sank down onto the bed. So... He was there this whole time, yet no one knew? No wonder Abby felt alone. Abby continued to flip through the journal, reading about how many more mysterious things happened to her and about Wendy's depression and loneliness. But it wasn't until she got to the back of the book that Abby shrieked and let the book slip from her hands. Abby dropped to the floor, slowly open, opening the book again. On the back of the cover of the journal was a sketch of Jeff, dated a week before Wendy disappeared but this was no ordinary portrait. He still wore the Joker makeup, but his face was more horribly mutilated. His eyelids, nose, and lips were all missing. Only color in the picture was the area around the mouth, where Wendy had scribbled in red ink. And underneath this picture, also written in red, was the last message. Jeff is here.